Chapter One of Escott Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Julie Yu. Escott Stories by Mary H. Foster and Mabel H. Cummings. Chapter One: The Story of the Beginning. The people who lived long ago in the far-off lands of the north watched the wonderful things that happened out of doors every day, just as we do. But they did not know about the one loving God, who is the Father of all, who made them and the world, and rules it by His wise laws. So they thought there must be a great many unseen powers living in the clouds, in the wind. In the storms, and the sunshine, and doing all those wonders that no man could do, and so those northern people, who were our own forefathers, came to believe in many gods: one for the sun, another for the thunder, another for the flowers, and so on. In the long dark winters, when the bright sun had gone away from them. This Northman had time to think many thoughts about the powers of frost, and wind, and storms, which they called giants. And they used to tell stories and sing songs about the short, bright summer, the thawing out of the streams and lakes, the coming of the birds and flowers. With great joy, the people saw the bright sun god Bother come back to them in the spring. After the long darkness, and knew that they owed their life to his friendly warmth and light. As we read the stories or myths told by those people long ago, we can see that they were meant to tell about the world around us. At first, the stories were told and sung from father to son, that is, from one generation to another. But later, when people learned how to write, These myths were written down and kept with great love and care. This is the story they told of the beginning. At first, before living creatures were in the world, it was all rough and without order. Far to the north, it was very cold, for ice and snow were everywhere. Toward the south, there was a fire. And from the meeting of the fire and the cold, a thick vapor was formed, from which sprang a huge giant. On looking about for some food, he saw a cow, who was also searching for something to eat. The ice tasted salt, and when the cow began to lick it, a head appeared, and at last the whole figure of a god stood before her. From these two, the giant and the god, came the two great races of giants and gods, who were always enemies to each other. The giants were constantly trying to break into Asgard, the home of the gods, in the sky. The gods, on the other hand, watched and planned to keep out the giants and to drive them back to their own stronghold, Yggdrasil. Our world. Where men and women lived was between Yggdrasil and Asgard. It was called Midgard, and around this Midgard world, under the ocean, was coiled a monstrous serpent, who grew so long that his tail grew down his throat. He was called the Midgard serpent. A wonderful tree named Yggdrasil connected all the worlds. This great ash tree had its roots in Yggdrasil, and the tops of its branches reached up so high as to overshadow Asgard. Its three main roots were watered by three fountains, and near one of them sat the wise giant Mimir, of whom we shall hear later. The Norns, three sisters, also lived at the roots of Yggdrasil. And were careful to see that it was watered every day. 
A little gray squirrel was always running up and down the tree, jacking his tail and hurrying to tell the news to everyone along the way. He was so anxious to be the first one to carry the news that many times he brought trouble to himself and to others. Because he was not always careful to tell a story just as he had heard it, and often everyone would have been happier if the squirrel had kept the story quite to himself. The gods and goddesses all together were called the Asia, and the chief and father of them all was Odin. His lofty throne rose high in the midst of Asgard, the sacred city. Which the gods had built for their beautiful home, from Asgard, arching over and down to the lower world, was a rainbow bridge, called Brifurst, the Trembling Bridge. Upon this, the dwellers in Asgard could travel every day, all except the mighty Thor. His thunder chariot was too heavy for the Trembling Bridge, so he had to go around a longer way. After the gods had made men and women, and had taught them to dwell on the earth, in the world of Midgard, Odin looked forth one morning from his heavenly seat to see what further work was waiting for his helping hand. He noticed far away below him a race of small beings, some of them busy in doing mischievous deeds, while others sat idle. Doing nothing, Odin sent for all these little people to come to him. And when they had reached Asgard, and were admitted to his palace of Glaisheim, they entered the great judgment hall, where they found all the Asher sitting, with Father Odin at their head. The little people waited in a crowd near the door, wondering what was going to happen to them. While Hermod, the messenger of the gods, ran to his master to say that they had come, then the All Father spoke to the little dwarfs about their evil deeds among men, and he told the naughtiest ones that they must go and live down underground and look after the great furnace fire in the middle of the earth to keep it always burning. Some must get coal to feed the fire, and others. Still, were to have charge of the gold, and silver, and precious stones under the rocks. Not one of these busy dwarfs must ever appear during the day. Only by night might they venture to leave their tasks. And now, said Odin, turning to the idle ones, "What have you been doing?" We were doing nothing at all, so we could not have harmed anyone, and we pray you to spare us," cried they. "Do you not know that those who sit idle when they should be doing good deserve punishment too?" said Odin. "I shall put you in charge of all the trees and flowers, and shall send one of the Asher to teach you, so that you may be doing some good in the world." Then the little elves went to work among the flowers, and Frey, the bright god of summer and sunshine, was a kind master to them. He taught them how to open the folded buds in the sunshine, to fill the honey cups, and lead the bees along the flower passages to find their food, to hatch the birds' eggs, and teach the little ones their songs. And then each night to fetch the water for dew drops, to be hung on every leaf and blade of grass. When their work was finished, and the moon had risen, these busy elves and fairies enjoyed many a happy evening, dancing and frisking on the green by moonlight. And so our world of Midgard was filled with busy work and play. Even now, in our time, the people in the lands of the north and in Germany have many old sayings and stories that have come down to them from the days long ago. There is a beautiful white flower in the north, which is called Baldur's Brow. 
because it is so pure and bright, like the face of the dear sun god Boulder. And in some places, where the farmers gather in the harvest of grain, they leave a little bunch of it standing in the field for Father Odin's horse. We have some English names to remind us of those old tales of our forefathers, for we have Tuesday, named for Tyr or Chu, the brave god who gave his right hand to save his friends; Wednesday or Woden's Day, named for Odin; Thursday for Thor, the thunder god; and Friday for either the goddess Frigga. Or Freya, or for Frey, the god of summer, who ruled the fairies. End of chapter one. Chapter two of Asgard stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Julie Yu. Asgard stories. By Mary H. Foster and Mabel H. Cummings, Odin's Reward. One night, when all was quiet in Asgard and the Aesir had gone to rest, Odin, the All Father, sat awake on his high throne, troubled with many thoughts. At his feet crouched his two faithful wolves, and upon his shoulders perched the two ravens of thought and memory. Who flew far abroad every day through the nine worlds as Odin's messengers? The All Father had need of great wisdom in ruling the worlds. After thinking for a long time on the matters which needed his care, he suddenly started up and went forth with long strides from his palace of Glasheim into the night. He soon returned. Leading his beautiful eight-footed steed, Snipner, and it was plain that Odin was going on a journey. He quickly mounted Snipner and rode swiftly away toward Brefers, the Rainbow Bridge, which reached from Asgard, the city of the gods, down through the air to the lower worlds. When Snipner stepped upon the bridge, it trembled. And seemed hardly strong enough to bear the horse and his rider, but they had no fear of its in giving way, and Snipner galloped swiftly onward. Soon, Odin saw Heimdall, the watchman of the bridge, riding toward him on a fine horse, with a golden mane that reflected light upon the noble face of his rider. You must be bound on some important errand, Father Odin. To be riding forth from Eska so late at night," said Heimdall. "It is indeed a most important errand, and I must hasten on," replied Odin. "It is well for us that we have such a faithful guardian of the trembling bridge. If it were not for you, Heimdall, our enemies might long ago have taken Asgard by storm. You are so watchful; you can hear the grass grow in the fields." And the wool gather on the backs of the sheep, and you need less sleep than a bird. I myself stand in great need of wisdom, in order to take care of such faithful servants and to drive back such wicked enemies. They hurried over the bridge until they came to Heimdall's far shining castle. At the farther end of it, this was a lofty tower which was placed so as to guard the bridge. And he sent forth into the land of the giant enemy such a wonderful clear light that Heimdall could see, even in the darkest night, anyone who came toward the bridge. Here, Odin stopped a few moments to drink the mead which the good Heimdall offered him. Then said Odin, "As I am journeying into the land of our enemies, I shall leave my good horse with you." There are not many with whom I would trust him, but I know that you, my faithful Heimdall, will take good care of him. I can best hide myself from the giants by going on as a wanderer. With these words, the old father quitted Heimdall's castle, 
and started off toward the north, through the land of the fierce giants. During all the first day, there was nothing to be seen but ice and snow. Several times, Odin was nearly crushed as the frost giants hurled huge blocks of ice after him. The second day, he came to mountains and broad rivers. Often, when he had just crossed over a stream, the mountain giants would come after him to the other bank, and when they found that Odin had escaped them, they would send forth such a fierce yell that the echoes sounded from hill to hill. At the end of the third day, Odin came to a land where trees were green and flowers blooming. Here was one of the three fountains which watered the world tree Yggdrasil, and nearby sat the wise giant Mimir, guarding the waters of this wonderful fountain. For whoever drank of it would have the gift of great wisdom. Mimir was a giant in size. But he was not one of the fierce giant enemies of the gods, for he was kind and wiser than the wisest. Mimir's well of wisdom was in the midst of a wonderful valley, filled with rare plants and bright flowers. And among the groves of beautiful trees were strange creatures, sleeping dragons, harmless serpents, and lizards. Wild birds with gay plumage flew and sang among the branches. Overall, this quiet valley shone a lovely soft light, different from sunlight, and in the center grew one of the roots of the great willow tree. Here, the wise giant Mimir sat gazing down into his well. Odin greeted the kind old giant and said, "Oh, Mimir." I have come from far away Asgard to ask a great boon. Gladly will I help you if it is in my power," said Mimir. "You know," replied Odin, "that as father of gods and men, I need great wisdom, and I have to come to beg for one drink of your precious water of knowledge. Trouble threatens us, even from one of the Asher." For Loki, the fire god, has lately been visiting the giants, and I fear he has been learning evil ways from them. The frost giants and the storm giants are always at work, trying to overthrow both gods and men. Great is my need of wisdom, and even though no one ever before has dared ask so great a gift, I hope that. Since you know how deep is my trouble, you will grant my request," Mimir said silently, thinking for several moments, and then said, "You ask a great thing indeed, Father Odin. Are you ready to pay the price which I must demand?" "Yes," said Odin cheerfully. I will give you all the gold and silver of Asgard, and all the jeweled shields and swords of the Asher. More than all, I will give up my eight-footed horse Snipner, if that is needed to win the reward. And do you suppose that these things will buy wisdom? Said Mimir. They can only be gained by bearing bravely and giving up to others. Are you willing to give me a part of yourself? Will you give up one of your own eyes? At this, Odin looked very sad. But after a few moments of deep thought, he looked up with a bright smile and answered, "Yes, I will even give you one of my eyes, and I will suffer whatever else is asked in order to gain the wisdom that I need." We cannot know all that Odin bravely suffered in that strange, bright valley before he was rewarded with a drink from that wonderful fountain. But we may be quite sure that never once was the good old father sorry for anything he had given up or any suffering he had borne for the sake of others. End of chapter two.
Chapter 3 of Asgard Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Julie Yu. Asgard Stories by Mary H. Forster and Mabel H. Cummings. Tear and the Wolf. Odin, the All Father, sat one day on his high air throne, and looking around him far and wide, saw three fierce monsters. They were the children of the mischievous fire god Loki. And Odin began to feel anxious, for they had grown so fast and were getting so strong that he feared they might do harm to the sacred city of Asgard. The wise father knew Loki had given strength to these dreadful creatures, and he saw that all this danger had come upon the Asha from Loki's wickedness. One of these monsters was a huge serpent that Odin sent down into the ocean, where he grew so fast that his body was coiled around the whole world, and his tail grew into his own mouth. He was called the Migat Serpent. The second monster was sent to Niflheim, the home of darkness, and shut up there. The third, a fierce wolf named Fenrir, was brought to Asgard, where Odin hoped he might be tamed by living among the Asha, and seeing their good deeds and hearing their kind words. But he grew more and more fierce until only one of all the gods dared to fit him. This was the brave god Tyr. He was a war god, like Thor, and it is sometimes called the Sword God. Tyr was loved by all because he was so true and faithful. Each day, the dreadful wolf grew larger and stronger, till all at once, before the Asher thought about it, he had become a very dangerous beast. Father Odin always looked troubled when he saw Fenrir, the wolf, come to get his evening meal of meat from Tyr's hand. And at last, one night, after the wolf had gone growling away to his lair, Odin called a meeting of the Asher. He told them of his fears, saying they must find some plan for guarding themselves and their home against this monster. They could not slay him, for no one must ever be killed, and no blood must be shed within the walls of the sacred city. Thor was the first to speak. Do not fear, Father Odin, for by tomorrow night we shall have Fenrir so safely bound that he cannot do us any harm. I will make a mighty chain with the help of my hammer, Mirna, and with it we will bind him fast. When the Aesir heard these words of Thor, they were glad, and all went home rejoicing. All save the old father, who was still troubled, for he well knew the danger, and feared that even the mighty Thor would find this task too much for him. But Thor seized his hammer and strode off to his forge. There. He worked the whole night long, and all through Asgard were heard the blows of Mirna and the roaring of the bellows. The next night, when the Asher were gathered together, Thor brought forth his new-made chain to test it. In came Fenrir, the wolf, and everyone was surprised to see how willingly he let himself be bound with the chain. When Thor had riveted the last links together, the gods smiled and began to praise him for his wonderful work. But all at once, the wolf gave one bound forward, broke the great chain and walked off to his lair as if nothing had happened. Thor was much disappointed. Still, he did not lose courage. He said to the Asher that he would make another chain, yet stronger. Again, he set to work, and for three nights and three days, the great Thor worked at his forge without resting. While he worked, his friends did not forget him, 
They came and looked on while he was busy, and as they watched the mighty hammer falling with quick blows upon the metal, they talked to Thor or sang noble songs to cheer him. Sometimes they brought him food and drink. One visitor, who was no friend, fierce Fenrir the wolf, sometimes put his nose in at the door for a moment and watched Thor at work. Then, as he went away, Thor heard a strange sound like a wicked laugh. At last, the chain was finished, and Thor dragged it to the palace of meeting. It was so heavy that even the mighty Thor could hardly lift it, or drag it as far as Odin's palace of Glasheim. This time, Fenrir was not so willing to be bound, but the gods coaxed him. And talked of his great strength, and told him they were sure he would easily break this chain. Also, after a while, he agreed to let them put it around his neck. This time, Thor was sure the chain would hold firm, for never before had such a strong one been made. But soon, with a great shake and a fierce bound, the wolf broke away, and went off to his lair. Snaring and showing his wicked teeth, while the broken chain lay on the ground. Sadly, the Asher came together that night in Odin's palace, and this time, Thor was not the first to speak. He sat apart and was silent. First spoke Frey, the god of summer and king of the fairies. "Hearken to me, O lords of Asgard," he said. I have not won a brave name in battle, like the noble Tyr. Neither have I done such mighty deeds as the great Thor, and others of our heroes. Instead of fighting giants and monsters, I have spent most of my life in the woods, among the flowers, listening for hours to the birds. Many things have I watched, some perhaps that my brothers thought too small to be worthy of notice. I have learned many lessons, and the greatest of them all is to know how much power there is in little things, and to see how often the work done quietly and hidden from the eyes of men is the finest and the most wonderful. Since we cannot make a chain strong enough to bind Fenrir, let us go to the little dwarfs who work in silence and in darkness. And asked them to make us a chain. The old father's troubled face grew brighter as he heard Fry speak, and he bade him send a messenger quickly to the dwarves to order a chain made as soon as possible. So Fry went out, leaving the Asher in their trouble, and came to his own lovely home, Elfheim. There, everything was bright and peaceful. And the little elves were busy and happy. Fry found a trusty messenger, and sent him with all speed to the dwarfs underground, to order the new chain, and to return as soon as he could bring it. The faithful servant found the funny little dwarf workmen, all busy in the dark rock chambers, far down inside the earth, while at one side, in a lighted place, sat their king. The messenger bowed before him, and told him his errand. The dwarfs were a wicked race, but they were afraid of Odin, for they had not forgotten the talk he once had with them, when he sent them down to work in darkness underground, and since that time, they never had dared disobey him. The dwarf king said it would take two days and two nights to make the chain. But it would be so strong that no one could break it. While the busy dwarfs were at work, the messenger looked about at the many wonderful things: the great central fire, which burns always in the middle of the earth, watched and fed with coal by the dwarfs. Above this, the beds of coal and bright precious diamonds. Which the dwarfs took from the ashes of the fire. 
In another place, he watched them putting gold and silver, tin and copper into the cracks in the rocks, and he drank of the pure underground water, which gives the Mika people fresh springs. After two days, this messenger returned to the dwarf king. The king, holding out in his hand a fine small chain, said to the messenger, "This may seem to you to be small and weak, but it is a most wonderful piece of work, for we have used it in all the strongest stuff we could find. It is made of six kinds of things." The noise made by the footfall of cats, the roots of stones, the beards of women, the voice of fishes, the spittle of birds, the sinews of bears. This chain can never be broken, and if you can once put it on Fenrir, he will never be able to throw it off. Odin's messenger was glad to hear this, so he thanked the dwarf king. And promising him a large reward, he went on his way back to Asgard, where the Æsir were longing for his return, and will all rejoice to see him with the magic chain. Now, Father Odin feared that Fenrir would not let them bind him a third time, so he proposed they should all take a holiday and go out to a beautiful lake to the north of Asgard. Where they would have games and trials of strength, the other gods were pleased with this plan, and all set out in Frey's wonderful ship, which was large enough to hold all the Asher with their horses, and yet could be folded up small enough to go in one's pocket. They landed on a lovely island in the lake, and after the races and games were over, Frey brought out a little chain. And asked them all to try to break it. Thor and Tyr tried in vain. Then Thor said, "I do not believe anyone but Fenrir can break it." Now the wolf did not want to be bound again, but he was very proud of his strength, and for fear of being called a coward, said at last, he would let them do it, if. He might hold the right hand of one of the Asher in his mouth while they bound him, as a sign that the gods did not mean to play any tricks. When the gods heard this, they looked at each other, and all but one of them drew back. Only the brave, good tears stepping forward, quietly put his hand into Fenrir's mouth. The other gods then put the chain around the beast and fastened it to a great rock. The fierce creature gave a leap to free himself, but the more he struggled, the tighter grew the chain. The Asher gathered about him in joy to see this, but their hearts were filled with sorrow when they saw that the noble Tyr had lost his right hand. The dreadful wolf had shut his teeth together. In his rage, when he found he could not get free, thus the brave Tyr dared to risk danger for the sake of saving others, and gave up even his right hand to gain peace and happiness for Asgard. End of chapter three. Chapter four of Asgard stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Julie Yu. Asgard Stories by Mary H. Foster and Mabel H. Cummings. Friar's Necklace. Yes, I really must have some flowers to wear to the feast tonight," said Friar to her husband Olda. Freya was the goddess of love and beauty. She was the most beautiful of all the Asia, and everyone loved to look at her charming face and to hear her sweet voice. I think you look quite beautiful enough as you are without flowers, Odin replied. But Freya was not satisfied. She thought she would go and find her brother Frey 
the god of summer, for he would give her a garland of flowers. So she wandered forth from Asgard on her way to Frey's bright home in Alfheim, where he lived among his happy, busy little elves. As Frey walked along, she was thinking of the feast to be given that night in Asgard, and knowing that all the gods and goddesses would be there, she wished to look her very best. On and on she wandered. Not thinking how far she was getting away from home, finally, the light began to grow fainter and fainter, and Freya found herself in a strange place. The sunlight had faded away, but there was still a little light that came from lanterns carried by funny little dwarfs who were busily working. Some were digging gold and gems, others were cleaning off the dirt from the precious stones. And polishing them to make them bright, while four little fellows were seated in one corner, putting the sparkling stones together into a wonderful necklace. What can the beautiful thing be? Thought Freya. If only I had that, it would surely make me look more beautiful than anyone else at the feast tonight. And the more she thought about it, the more she longed to get it. Oh, I really must have it," she said to herself. And with these words, she stepped nearer to the four little men. "For what price will you sell me your necklace?" she asked. The dwarfs looked up from their work, and when they saw Frey's lovely face and heard her sweet voice, said, "Oh, if you will only look kindly upon us and be our friend." You may have the necklace. Then a mocking laugh echoed again and again through the dark cavern, seeming to say, "How foolish you are to wish for these bright diamonds! They will not make you happy." But Freya snatched the necklace and ran out of the cavern. It did not please her to hear the teasing laugh of the dwarfs, and she wanted to get away from them as soon as possible. At last, she was once more out in the open air. She tried to be free and happy again, but a strange feeling of dread came over her, as if something were going to happen. Soon, she came to a still pool of water, and putting on the necklace, she bent over to look at her picture in the clear water. How beautiful the diamonds were! And how they sparkled in the sunshine! She must hasten home to show them to Olda. The fair goddess soon reached Asgard, and hurried to the palace to find her husband. But Olda was not there. Over and over again, she searched through all the rooms in vain. He had gone, and although Freya had her beautiful necklace, she cared little for it. Without her dear husband, soon it was time to go to the feast, but Freya would not go without Olda. She sat down and wept bitter tears. She felt no joy now for having the necklace, and no sorrow because she could not feast with the Asha. If only Olda would come back, all would be well again. I will go to the end of the world to find him. Said Freya, and she began to make ready for her journey. Her chariot, drawn by two cats, was soon ready. But before she could start, she must first ask Father Odin to allow her to go. Oh, Father, I beg you, give me leave to go to look for my Odin in every corner of the world. The wise father replied, "Go, fair Freya." And may you find whom you seek. Then she started forth, first to the Midgard world. The goddess of beauty went, but no one in all the world has seen or heard of Olda. Down under the earth, to Niflheim, and even to Yggdrasil, the land of giants, she wandered. But still, no one has seen or even heard of her husband. Poor Freya wept many tears, 
and wherever the teardrops fell and sank into the ground, they turned into glistening gold. At last, the sad goddess returned to her own palace alone. She still wore the wonderful necklace, which was called Brisingamen. One night, when the hour was late, all the Asia were asleep, except the ever watchful Heimda, who heard soft footsteps, like those of a cat, near Friar's palace. He listened and thought, "That is surely someone bent on mischief. I must follow him." When Heimdall reached the palace, he found it was Loki, changed into another form, creeping softly about. Heimdall quickly watched him, and saw him glide into Freya's bedside, where the fair goddess lay asleep, wearing her beautiful necklace. Loki had come to steal the necklace, but when he saw that she was lying on the clasp of the chain. So that he could not undo it without waking her, he changed himself into a gnat, and crawling along on the pillow, stung her just enough to make her turn over, but not enough to wake her. Then he unclasped the chain and ran off with it as fast as he could. But Heimdall was not going to let the thief get away. As soon as Loki found that he was followed, he took his other form, a little flame of fire. Heimdall then took his other shape and became a shower of rain to put out the fire. But Loki, quick and watchful, changed himself into a bear to catch the rain. Then Heimdall too became a bear, and a fierce fight began. At last, the rain god conquered. And forced wicked Loki to give back the necklace to Freya. The whole land seemed to feel sorry for poor lonely Freya. The leaves fell from the trees, the bright flowers faded, and the singing birds flew away. Once more, the fair goddess went forth from Asgard to seek Odin. Away, away, to the far-off sunny south she wandered. And there, where the myrtle trees and the oranges grow, at last, she found her long-lost husband. Then, hand in hand, the two turned northward again to their home. And so happy were they together that they spread joy and happiness around them as they passed along. Everywhere, the ice and snow thawed before them. Green grass and sweet flowers sprang up behind their footsteps. The birds sang their sweetest songs. The warm summer came back to the Northlands, and everyone was glad and joyful, for lovely, smiling Freya was at home again. White were the moorlands and frozen before her. Green were the moorlands and blooming behind her. Out of her gold locks. Shaking the spring flowers, out of her garments, shaking the south wind, around in the birches, are waking the throstles. Beautiful Friar came, Kingsley. End of chapter four. Chapter five of Asgard Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Julie Yu. Asgard Stories by Mary H. Foster and Mabel H. Cummings. The Hammer of Thor. Sif was the wife of mighty Thor, the Thunder God, and she was very proud of her beautiful golden hair, which she combed and braided with great care. One morning. When she awoke, she was filled with grief and dismay to find that her lovely hair had been cut off in the night while she slept. Her husband happened to be away that day, but when he came home late at night, Sif was careful to keep out of his sight. She felt so ashamed of her shorn head. 
Thor, however, soon called for Sif, and when he saw what had been done to her, he was very angry. Now Thor had a quick temper; everyone feared his fierce anger. Who could have done this wicked deed? Thought he. There is only one among all the Asia who would think of doing such a thing. Thor lost no time in finding Loki, and that mischief god had to admit that he was the guilty one. But he begged Thor to give him just a few days, and he promised to get something for Sif that would make her look more beautiful than ever. So Thor decided to give him a chance to try. And commanded him to give back to Sif her golden hair. Now, Loki knew a place where some wonderful workmen lived, so he went off as fast as he could to Niflheim, the home of the dwarfs under the earth, and asked one of them to make quickly some golden hair for Sif. Besides this, he asked for two gifts to carry to the gods Odin and Frey. So that they might be on his side if Thor should bring this complaint before the Asia. Loki did not have to wait long before the dwarf brought him a quantity of beautiful hair, spun from the finest golden thread. It had the wonderful power of growing just like real hair as soon as it touched anyone's head. Besides this, there was a spear for Odin, which never missed its aim. No matter how far it was thrown, and for Frey, a ship that could sail through the air as well as the sea, although it was large enough to hold all the gods and the horses, yet it could be folded so it was small enough to put in one's pocket. Loki was greatly pleased with this wonderful presence, and declared that. This dwarf must be the most skillful workman of them all. Now, it happened that another dwarf named Brock heard him say this, and he told Loki that he was sure he and his brother could make more wonderful things than these. Loki did not believe that could be done, but he told Brock to try his skill. The Aesir should judge between them. And the one who should fail in the trial must lose his head. Then Brock called his brother Sindri, and they set to work at once. They first built a great fire, and Sindri threw into it a lump of gold. Then he told Brock to blow the bellows while he went out, and be sure not to stop blowing until he should come back. Brock thought this an easy task. But his brother had not long been gone, when a huge fly came in and buzzed about his face, and bothered him so that he could hardly keep on blowing. Still, he was able to finish his work, so that when Sindri came back, they took out of the fire an enormous wild boar, which gave a light and could travel through the air with wonderful speed. On the second day. Sindri threw another lump of gold into the fire, and left his brother to blow the bellows. Again, the buzzing, stinging fly came, and was even more troublesome than before. But Brock tried very hard to be patient, and was able to bear it without stopping his work until Sindri returned. Then they took from the fire a magic ring of gold. From which eight new rings fell off every week. The third day, a lump of iron was put into the fire, and Brock was again left alone. In came the cruel fly. Have you guessed that it was really that mischief maker Loki? He bit the poor little dwarf so hard on the forehead that the blood ran down into his eyes, and blinded him so that he could no longer see to do his work. Poor Brock had to stop just before Sindri came home, but not before the hammer, which they were making in the fire, was nearly finished. 
only the handle came out rather too short. This magic hammer was named Myrna. It had the power of never missing its mark, and would always return to the hand which threw it. When Loki appeared at last before the Asha, with the two dwarf brothers and the gifts, it was declared that they had made the finest things. For the hammer, which was given to Thor, would surely be most useful in keeping the giants out of Asgard. When Loki found that the judgment was against him, he started to run away. But Thor soon made him turn back by threatening to throw his hammer after him. Then Loki had to collect his wits and think of some way to escape losing his head. Instead of making the dwarves pay the forfeit as he had expected, at last he told Brock and Sindri that they could have his head, according to the agreement. But as nothing had been said about his neck, they could not, of course, touch that. Thus, the wily Loki, by his wit, saved his life. End of chapter five. Chapter six of Asgard Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Julie Yu. Asgard Stories by Mary H. Foster and Mabel H. Cummings. Thor's Wonderful Journey. One morning, Thor asked Loki, the Fire God, if he would like to go forth with him to Yugard, the stronghold of the giants, where he was going to try with his mighty hammer. To conquer those fierce enemies of Asgard, Loki was glad to go with him, and the two gods started forth in Thor's chariot, drawn by two goats. Thor often went on a journey, so the dwellers in Asgard did not wonder to see him getting ready for a long drive. As Thor and Loki drove along, the heavy chariot rattled and made the thunder echo among the hills. People in our world. Down below in Midgard, heard the rumbling and said, "What a heavy thunderstorm! How the thunder crashes and rumbles!" Toward evening, the travelers stopped at a peasant's hut, and Thor, alighting from his chariot, went to the door of the house to ask shelter for the night. "I will gladly give you a room, but I have no food in the house." Said the man who opened the door. Oh, never mind that," said Thor. "I will provide the food." So Thor and Loki stopped for the night at the peasant's hut. They found the family within: the man, his wife, and two children, a boy and a girl. All looked on in great surprise to see Thor kill his two goats and cook them for the evening meal. Eat all you wish of the meat," said Thor. But be careful not to break any of the bones. Throw them all into the two skins which I have spread upon the floor. Now the boy, whose name was Thiof, wondered why Thor should say this, and as he happened to have a piece of the leg bone, he thought there could be no harm in breaking it open to get out the soft marrow to eat. Thor was just then talking to Loki. And did not notice what had been done. But next morning, the boy learned the lesson that he never forgot. When Thor was ready to start off again next day, he held his magic hammer over the skins in which lay the bones. All at once, the goats became whole again, and stood there just the same as before, except that one of them limped with his hind leg. Then the young Thiof knew. Why Thor had told them not to break the bones. At first, when he saw Thor's angry face and how he grasped his hammer, the boy was frightened and wanted to run away. But soon he remembered it would be cowardly to do that, so he went to Thor and asked his forgiveness. Now the mighty thunder god, though often angry, was always just and kind. 
after scolding the boy as he deserved, he freely forgave him, and said that he and his sister might go along with Loki and himself on their journey. The four started off after saying goodbye to the peasant and his wife, leaving in their charge the chariot and goats, for it seemed best to finish the journey on foot. At nightfall, they entered a thick forest, through which they wandered on for miles. When all at once they came upon a house, and a strange-looking house it was. The wide front door opened into a big room. At the left was a small room, and just opposite the front door were four long, narrow rooms. The travelers wondered to find a house in the depths of a forest, but they were glad to have shelter for the night, and all lay down for a good rest. Soon after midnight, they were awakened by groans and strange sounds, and the earth began to tremble. Thor sent his companions into the farthest room, grasped his hammer, and stood on guard by the door. At daybreak, he started forth to find out what had caused the noise. He had not gone far when he came upon a huge giant lying on the ground asleep, and Thor found that he was making the earth tremble with his snoring, which must have been the sound they heard in the night. While Thor was looking at the giant, he awoke and spoke to the god. Ho, ho! I think you little fellow must be Thor, of whom I have often heard. But really, I did not think you were quite so small. Now the sun is up, and I must be off. But where is my other glove? Oh, here it is on the ground. And the giant stooped and picked up his glove. Which was the very house in which our four travelers had spent the night, with the big front door where the hen went in, the thumb for the one side room, and the four narrow finger rooms opposite the door. If you're going my way, you may come along with me," said the giant. So they journeyed together for one day, but even mighty Thor could hardly keep up with the giant's long strides. When night came, the giant stopped under a large oak tree and said, "I'm going to sleep. You may eat your supper if you wish. Here is a bag full of things." Saying this, he fell asleep and was soon snoring. But when Thor tried to open the bag of food, he could not untie the cord. This made him angry, for the giant had tied up their food with his own. He looked at the huge figure lying before him asleep, and when he thought what a mean trick the giant had played upon them, Thor seized the magic hammer and threw it at him. "Did a leaf fall on me?" said the giant, sleepily. "Haven't you eaten your supper yet?" "Well, I'm going to sleep again." And soon he was snoring louder than before. Thor grasped his hammer, tighter than ever, and threw it with such strength that it seemed as though it must surely have killed the giant. But again, he rubbed his eyes and said, "I thought an acorn fell on my head." He had hardly spoken when he was asleep again. Then a third time, Thor hurled his hammer with all his strength. And it seemed to hit his enemy in the forehead, and was buried out of sight. But the giant only said, "I think there must be birds overhead in this tree. I thought a feather dropped down on me." Are you awake, Thor? I think we'd better be going on with our journey. And if you are bound to go to Yugad, I will show you the way. But I advise you to go home instead. You will find bigger fellows than I in Yugad. But Thor had made up his mind to go on, and nothing could make him change. At noon time, the four friends left their giant guide, 
whose path led another way. They had not traveled far when Thor spied a large city looming up before them, and soon they came to Yugad, the home of the fierce giants. Although it was surrounded by high walls, Thor and his friends were able to creep through the bars of the great gate. When they came to the palace and found this door open, they went in, and there sat all the giants with the king, Yugad Loki, at their head. A quite different Loki was this giant king from the mischievous fire god, the Loki from Asgard, who now stood before him. Upon seeing the four strangers, the king of the giants said, Why? This must be the god Thor. I really did not suppose that you were such a little fellow, Thor, but probably you are stronger than you look. Now, before you sit down at our table, you must each show some proof of your strength. Then Loki, who was very hungry, said, he was sure he could eat more than anyone else. So the king called one of the giants to come forth, saying to Loki, If you can indeed eat more than one of my men, you will perform a great feat. A huge trough full of meat was brought in, and Loki began eating at one end, while the giant began at the other. They reached the center together, the Loki had eaten only the meat, while the giant had devoured meat, bones, trough, and all. Thyof, the peasant boy, took his turn next and boasted that he was the fastest runner of them all. Oh, said the king, it will be a most wonderful feat if you can win a race against one of my men. The first time Thyof ran the course, he kept ahead until near the end and was beaten by only a few yards. The second time he came off worse, and the third time he was only halfway around when the giant had reached the goal. Thor, however, was not at all cast down by the failure of the others, and he proposed to try a drinking match. So the king brought forth a long drinking horn, saying, my men usually empty this in one draught if they were very thirsty, though sometimes they have to take it in two swallows or even three. Then Thor put his lips to the drinking horn and took one long deep pull, thinking he had surely emptied it. But to his surprise, the water had lowered only a few inches. Again, he lifted the horn feeling sure he should empty it this time. Yet, he did no better than before. The king said, You have left a great deal for your last drink. This made Thor try his very best, but it was of no use. He could not empty the horn. So, you are not as strong as you seemed after all. Do you care to try anything else? said the king of the giants in a mocking tone. Oh, certainly, anything you like, replied Thor. Well, said the king, I will give you something easy this time, since I see you are not as strong as I expected. You may try to lift this cat from the floor. It should be mere child's play for one of my men. Thor put out his hand to lift the cat but he could raise only one paw, though he used all his strength. Well, it is no more than I expected, said the king. You boast of your strength, but you do not show it to us. By this time, Thor was getting very angry, and he spoke fiercely. I will challenge any one of you to fight with me. The king looked about the hall to find someone small enough to wrestle with Thor. Then he said, All my men are too large. I shall have to send for one of the women. Soon, a bent old woman came hobbling in, and Thor thought it would be nothing to overcome her. But the longer they wrestled, the stronger the old woman became. And at last, when it was plain that she was going to win, and Thor had been thrown down upon the floor, 
The king called to them to stop. Thor and his friends were then invited to sit down at the feast, and the next morning, after a good breakfast, they started on the journey homeward. Yugat Loki, the giant king, went with them to the city gate, and when he was about to leave them, said. Do you find it as easy as you expected to overthrow the giants? No, said Thor, who was too honest to hide his shame. I am vexed that I have done so little, and I know that after this failure, you will all laugh at my weakness. No, indeed, replied the king. Since you are now well outside our stronghold, I will tell you the truth about what you saw there. And I will take good care not to let you get in again. You have greatly surprised us all, for we did not dream that you were so strong, and I have had to use magic to hold out against you. When you met the first giant in the forest, you would have killed him with your hammer, if he had not put a mountain between himself and you. Loki was a wonderful eater, but we matched him against fire. <laughs> And who can devour more than fire? The boy was a swift runner, and I had to make him race against thought in order to beat him. What can be swifter than thought? The horn, from which you drank, was the ocean, and you took such a mighty draught that the people in Midgard saw the tide ebb. It was really not a cat you tried to lift, but the Midgard serpent. And you pulled him so far that we feared he would let go his hold. Then you wrestled with old age, and who is there that can overcome old age? With these words, the giant king vanished, and Thor, upon looking around, saw the city of Yugard was also gone. Then silently, but with many thoughts of these strange things, Thor and Loki, with the boy and the girl. Made the way back to Asgard. End of chapter six. Chapter seven of Asgard stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Julie Yu. Asgard stories by Mary H. Foster. And Mabel H. Cummings, how Thor lost his hammer. Come, Loki, are you ready? My goats are eager to be off," cried Thor, as he sprang into his chariot, and away they went, thundering over the hills. All day long they journeyed, and at night they lay down to rest by the side of a brook. When Balder. The bright sun god awoke them in the morning. The first thing Thor did was to reach out for Mjolnir, his magic hammer, which he had carefully laid by his side the night before. Why, Loki! cried he. Alas, my hammer is gone. Those evil frost giants must have stolen it from me while I slept. How shall we hold Asgard against them without my hammer? They will surely take our stronghold. We must go quickly and find it," replied Loki. "Let us ask Freya to lend us her falcon garment." Now the goddess Freya had a wonderful garment made of falcon feathers, and whoever wore it looked just like a bird. As you may suppose, this was sometimes a very useful thing. So. Thor and Loki went quickly back to Asgard, and drove with all speed to Freya's palace, where they found her sitting among her maidens. Asgard is in great danger," said Thor, "and we have come to you, fair goddess, to ask if you will lend us your falcon garment, for my hammer has been carried off, and we must go in search of it." Surely," answered Freya. I would lend you my falcon cloak, even if it were made of gold and silver. Then, 
Loki quickly dressed himself in Freya's garment and flew away to the land of the frost giants, where he found their king making collars of gold for his dogs and combing his horses. As Loki came near, he looked up and said, Ah, Loki, how fair the mighty gods in Asgard! The Asia are in great trouble, replied Loki, and I am sent to fetch the hammer of Thor. And do you think I am going to be foolish enough to give it back to you after I have had all the trouble of getting it into my power? said the king. I have buried it deep, deep down in the earth. And there is only one way by which you can get it again. You must bring me the goddess Freya to be my wife. Loki did not know what to say to this, for he felt sure that Freya would never be willing to go away from Asgard to live among the fierce giants. But as he saw no chance of getting the hammer, he flew back to Asgard to see what could be done. Thor was anxiously looking out for him. What news do you bring, Loki? cried he. Have you brought me my hammer again? Alas, no, said Loki. I bring only a message from the giant king. He will not give up your hammer until you persuade Freya to marry him. Then Thor and Loki went together to Freya's palace, and the fair goddess greeted them kindly. But when she heard their errand and found that they wished her to marry the cruel giant, she was very angry and said to Thor, You should not have been so careless as to lose your hammer. It is all your own fault that it is gone, and I will never marry the giant to help you get it again. Thor then went to tell Father Odin, who called the meeting of all the Asia, for it was a very serious matter they were to consider. If the king of the giants only knew the power of the mighty hammer, he might storm Asgard and carry off the fair friar to be his bride. So the Asia met together in their great judgment hall. In the palace of Glassheim, long and anxiously they talked over their peril, trying to find some plan for saving Asgard from these enemies. At last, Heimdall, the faithful watchman of the Rainbow Bridge, proposed a plan. Let us dress Thor, said he, in Friar's robes, braid his hair, and let him wear Friar's wonderful necklace and the bridal veil. No, indeed, cried Thor angrily. You would all laugh at me in a woman's dress. I will do no such thing. We must find some other way. But when no other way could be found, at last Thor was persuaded to try Heimdall's plan and the Asia went to work to dress the mighty thunder god like a bride. He was the tallest of them all, and of course, he looked very queer to them in his woman's clothes. But he would be small enough beside the giant. Then they dressed Loki to look like the bride's waiting maid, and the two set off for Yugard, the stronghold of the giants. When the giant king saw them coming, he bade his servants make ready the wedding feast and invited all his giant subjects to come and celebrate his marriage with the lovely goddess Freya. So the wedding party sat down to the feast and Thor, who was always a good eater, ate one ox and ate salmon and drank three casks of meat. The king watched him, greatly surprised to see a woman eat so much, and said, 
Where hast thou seen such a hungry bride? But the watchful Loki, who stood nearby as the bride's waiting maid, whispered in the king's ear, Eight nights has Friar fasted and would take no food. So anxious was she to be your bride. This pleased the giant, and he went toward Thor, saying he must kiss his fair bride. But when he lifted the bridal veil, such a gleam of light shot from Thor's eyes that the king started back and asked, Why Friar's eyes were so sharp? Again, Loki replied, For eight nights, the fair friar has not slept, so greatly did she long to reach here. This again pleased the king, and he said, Now, let the hammer be brought and given to the bride, for the hour has come for our marriage. All this time, Thor was so eager to get his treasure back, that he could hardly keep still. And if it had not been for what the wily Loki said, he might have been found out too soon. But at last, the precious hammer was brought and handed to the bride. As was always the custom at weddings, as soon as Thor grabs it in his hand, he threw off his woman's robe and stood out before the astonished giants. Then did the mighty thunderer sweep down his foes, and many of the cruel frost giants were slain. Once more, the sacred city of Asgard was saved from danger, for Thor was its defender, and he was careful never again to let his magic hammer be taken from him. Besides the hammer, Thor had two other precious things, his belt of strength, which doubled his power when he tightened it, and his iron glove, which he put on when he was going to throw the hammer. I am the god Thor. I am the war god. I am the thunderer. Here in my Northland, my fastness and fortress, Reign I forever. Here amid icebergs, rule I the nations. This is my hammer, Mirna the mighty. Giants and sorcerers cannot withstand it. These are the gauntness wherewith I wield it, and hurl it afar off. This is my girdle. Whenever I brace it, Strength is redoubled, Longfellow. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of Asgard Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Julie Yu Asgard Stories by Mary H. Foster and Mabel H. Cummings A Gift from Frigga Long years ago, there lived a peasant and his wife who led a quiet, busy life on their little farm at the foot of a mountain. While the wife was busy indoors with her housework, her husband watched his flocks in the fields or sometimes wandered up the mountainside to hunt for game, which he would carry home for dinner. One day, he had strayed farther than usual and found himself on the top of the mountain, where the ground was covered with ice and snow. All at once, he came upon a high-arched doorway opening into a great glacier and he passed through to see whither it might lead. The passageway widened out into a wonderful cavern, like a broad hall, sparkling with precious stones, 
and long shining stalactites that looked like icicles of marble. In the midst stood a beautiful goddess surrounded by fair maidens, all dressed in silvery robes and crowned with flowers. The shepherd was so overcome by the wonder of this sight that he sank upon his knees. Then the goddess stretched forth her hands and gave him her blessing, telling him to choose whatever he wished to carry home from the cavern. The man was no longer afraid when he heard her kind voice speaking to him. So he looked about and at last humbly asked to have the pretty blue flowers which the fair one held in her hand. The lovely goddess Frigga, or Holda, as the German people called her, smiled kindly and told the poor shepherd he had made a wise choice. She gave him her bunch of blue flowers with a measure of seed, saying to him, You will live and be prosperous so long as the flowers do not fade. The peasant bowed thankfully before the goddess, and when he rose, she had vanished, and he was alone on the mountainside, just as usual, with no cavern, no sparkling stones, and no fair maidens to be seen. If it had not been for the pretty blue flowers and the measure of seed in his hand, he would have thought it all a dream. He hurried homeward to tell his wife, who was angry when she heard the story, for she thought he had made such a foolish choice. How much better it would have been, said she, if you had brought home some of those precious stones you tell about, which are worth money, instead of these good-for-nothing flowers. The poor man bore her angry words quietly and made the best of what he had. He went to work at once to sow his seeds, which he found, to his surprise, were enough to plant several fields. Every morning before he led his flock to pasture, and on his way home at night, he watched the little green shoots growing in his fields even his wife was pleased when she saw the lovely blue blossoms of the flax opening. Then, after they had withered and fallen, the seeds formed. Sometimes it seemed to the good man, as he stood in the twilight looking over his field, that he saw a misty form, like the beautiful goddess, stretching out her hands over the field of flax to give it her blessing. When at length the seeds had ripened, Frigga came again to show the peasant how to gather his harvest of flax and to teach his wife to spin and weave it into fine linen, which she bleached in the sun. The people came from far and near to buy the linen, and the peasant and his wife found themselves busy and happy, with money enough and to spare. When they had lived many years and were growing old among their children and grandchildren, the peasant noticed one day that a bunch of blue flowers had given to him so many years before, which had always kept bright, were beginning to fade. Then he knew he had not much longer to stay. He climbed slowly up the mountainside and found the door of the cavern open. A second time he went in, and the kind goddess Frigga took the peasant by the hand and led him away to stay with her, where she always took care of him. Frigga was the queen of the gods, and she helped her husband Odin govern the world. It was her part to look after the children 
and help the mothers take care of their families. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of Asgard Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Julie Yu Asgard Stories by Mary H. Foster and Mabel H. Cummings The Stealing of Iduna Odin, the wise father of the gods, started off one day on a journey through Midgard, the world of men, to see how his people were getting on and to give them help. He took with him his brother Hernir, the light giver, and Loki, the fire god. Loki, you know, was always ready to go wherever he could have any fun or do any mischief. All the morning they went about among the homes of Midgard, and whenever Odin found busy, faithful workers, he was sure to leave behind some little thing which would hardly be noticed. A straw in the farmer's barn, or a kernel of grain in the furrow by the plough or a bit of iron at the blacksmith's forge. But always, happiness and plenty followed his little gift. At noontime, Loki was so hungry that he begged Odin to stop for dinner. So when they came to a shady spot by the bank of a river, the three gods chose it for their resting place. Odin threw himself down under a tree and began to read his little book of runes, or wise sayings. But Loki began to make a fire and get ready for the feast. Then he started off to a farmhouse nearby, leaving Hörner to cook the meat which they had brought. As Loki came near the farmhouse, he thought to himself, I will change myself into a cat, and then I can have a better chance to spy about. So, he changed himself into a black cat, and jumping upon the kitchen window sill, he saw the farmer's wife taking some cakes out of the oven. They smelled so good and looked so tempting that Loki said to himself, What a price those cakes would be for our dinner! Just then, the woman turned back to the oven to get more cakes, and Loki snatched those which she had laid on the table. The good housewife soon missed her cakes. She looked all about and could not think what had become of them. But just as she was taking the last lot from the oven, she turned quickly around and saw the tail of a cat whisking out of the window. There, cried she, the wicked black cat has stolen my nice cakes. I will go after him with my broom. By the time she reached the door, all she could see was a cow walking in her garden. And when she came there to drive her away, nothing was to be seen except a big raven and six little ones flying overhead. Then, the mischievous Loki went back to the riverbank, where he had left his two friends, and showed them the six cakes, boasting of the good joke he had played upon the poor woman. But Odin did not think it was a joke. He scolded Loki for stealing, and said, It is a shame for one of the Asia to be a thief. Go back to the farmhouse and put these three black stones on the kitchen table. Loki knew that the stones meant something good for the poor woman, and he did not wish to go back to the house, but he had to do as the old father told him. As he went along, he heard his friends, the foxes, who put their heads out of the holes and laughed at his tricks. For the foxes thought Loki was the biggest thief of them all. Changing himself into an owl, Loki flew in at the kitchen window and dropped from his beak the three stones which, when they fell upon the white table, 
seemed to be three black stains. The next time the good woman came into her kitchen, she was surprised to find that the dinner was all cooked. And so the wonderful stones that Odin had sent brought good luck. The housewife always found her food ready cooked, and all her jars and boxes filled with good things to eat, and never again was in need. The other women all said she was the best housekeeper in the village, but one thing always troubled her, and that was the table with the three black stains. She scrubbed and scrubbed, but could never make it white again. And now we must go back to Loki. He was very hungry by this time, and hoped that Hermia would have the meat nicely cooked when he came back to the river bank. But when they took it out of the kettle, they found it was not cooked at all. So Odin went on reading his book of runes, not thinking about food, while Hermia and Loki watched the fire. And at the end of an hour. They looked again at the meat. Now it will surely be done this time," said Loki. But again, they were disappointed, for the meat in the kettle was still raw. Then they began to look about to see what magic might be at work, and at last spied a big eagle sitting on a tree near the fire. All at once, the bird spoke and said. If you will promise to give me all the meat I can eat, it shall be cooked in a few minutes. The three friends agreed to this, and in a short time, as the bird had promised, the meat was well done. Loki was so hungry, he could hardly wait to get it out of the kettle. But suddenly, the eagle pounced down upon it, and seized more than half. Which made Loki so angry that he took up a stick to beat the bird. And what do you think happened? Why, the stick, as soon as it touched the bird's back, stuck fast there, and Loki found he could not let go his end of it. Then away flew the eagle, carrying Loki with him, over the fields and over the tree tops. Until it seemed as though his arms would be torn from his body, he begged for mercy, but the bird flew on and on. At last, Loki said, "I will give you anything you ask if you will only let me go." Now, the eagle was really the cruel storm giant Tiasi, and he said, "I will never let you go until you promise to get for me." From Asgard, the lovely goddess Iduna, and her precious apples. When Odin and Hrungnir saw Loki whisked off through the air, they knew that the eagle must be one of their giant enemies. So they hurried home to Asgard to defend their sacred city. Just as they came to be first, the Rainbow Bridge, Loki joined them. But he took care not to tell them how the eagle came to let him go. Odin felt sure that Loki had been doing something wrong, but knowing very well that Loki would not tell him the truth, he made up his mind not to ask any questions. The goddess Iduna, whom Loki was to tempt away out of Asgard, was the dearest of them all. She was the fair goddess of spring. And of youth, and all the Asia loved her. Her garden was the loveliest spot, with all sorts of bright, sweet flowers, birds singing by day and night, little chattering brooks under the great trees, and everything happy and fresh. The gods loved to go and sit with Iduna, and rest in her beautiful garden within the walls of Asgard. There was another delightful thing in the garden, and that was Iduna's casket. This was a magic box filled with big golden red apples, 
which she always gave her friends to taste. These wonderful apples were not only delicious to eat, but whoever tasted them, no matter how tired or feeble he might be, would feel young and strong again. So the dwellers in Asgard ate often of this wonderful fruit, which kept them fresh and young, fit to help the people in the world of Midgard. The casket in which Iduna kept her apples was always filled. For whenever she took out one, another came in its place. But no one knew where it came from, and only the goddess of youth herself could take the apples from the box. For if anyone else tried, the fruit grew smaller and smaller as the hand came nearer, until at last it vanished away. A few days after Loki's bargain with the giant Thiasi, Iduna was in her bright garden one morning, watering the flowers, when her husband Bragi came to say goodbye to her, because he must go on a journey. Loki watched him start off and thought, Now, here is my chance to tempt Iduna away from Asgard. After a while, he went to the garden and found the lovely goddess sitting among her flowers and birds. She looked up at Loki with such a sweet smile as he came near, that he felt almost ashamed of his cruel plan. But he sat down on a grassy bank and asked Iduna for one of her magic apples. After tasting it, he smacked his lips, saying, do you know, fair Iduna, as I was coming home toward Asgard one day, I saw a tree full of apples which were really larger and more beautiful than yours. I do wish you would go with me and see them. Why? How can that be? said Iduna. For Father Odin has often told me that my apples were the largest and finest he ever saw. I should so like to see those others, and I think I will go with you now to compare them with mine. Come on then, said Loki, and you'd better take along your own apples so that we can try them with the others. Now, Bragi had often told Iduna that she must never wander away from home, but Thinking it would do no harm to go such a little way, just this once, she took the casket of apples in her hand and went with Loki. They had hardly passed through the garden gate when she began to wish herself back again. But Loki, taking her by the hand, hurried along to the Rainbow Bridge. They had no sooner crossed over Beefrest then Iduna saw a big eagle flying toward them. Nearer and nearer he came, until at last he swooped down and seized poor Iduna with his sharp talons and flew away with her to his cold, barren home. There she stayed shut up for many long, dreary months, always longing to get back to Asgard to see Bragi and her lovely garden. The giant Thiasi had long been planning that if he could only once get the fair goddess of youth in his power, he would eat her magic apples and so get strength enough to conquer the Asia. But now, after all, she would not give him even one of them. And when he put his hand into the casket, the apples grew smaller and smaller until at last they vanished so that he could not get even a taste. This cruel storm giant kept poor Iduna closely shut up in a little rock chamber, hoping that someday he could force her to give him what he wanted. All day long, she heard the sea beating on the rocks below her gloomy cell, but she could not look out, for the only window was a narrow opening in the rock high up above her head. She saw no one but the giant and his serving women, 
who waited upon her. When these women first came to her, Iduna was surprised to see that they were not ugly or stern looking. And when she looked at their fair smiling faces, she hoped they would be friendly and pitiful to her in her trouble. She begged them to help her, and with many tears told them her sad story. But still, they kept on smiling. And when they turned their backs, Iduna saw that they were hollow. These were the ill women who had no hearts and so could never be sorry for anyone. When one is in trouble, it is very hard to be with ill women. Every day, the giant came to ask Iduna, in his terrible voice, if she had made up her mind to give him the apples. Iduna was frightened, but she always had courage enough to say no, for she knew it would be false and cowardly to give to a wicked giant these precious gifts which were meant for the high gods. Although it was hard to be a prisoner and to see no one but the cold, fair elf women who kept on smiling at her tears, she knew it was far better to belong to the bright Asia, even in prison, than to be a giant or an elf woman, no matter how free or smiling they might be. All this while, the dwellers in Asgard were sad and lonely without their dear Iduna. At first, they went to her garden as before, but they missed the bright goddess, and soon the garden itself grew dreary. The fresh green leaves turned brown and fell. The flowers faded, and no new buds opened. No bird songs were heard. And the saddest thing of all was that now the gods had no more of the wonderful apples to keep them fresh and strong. While two strangers, named Age and Pain, walked about the city of Asgard, and the Asia felt themselves growing tired and feeble. Every day they watched for Iduna's return. At last, when day after day had passed, and still she did not come. A meeting of all the gods and goddesses were called to talk over what they should do and where they should search for their lost sister. Loki, you may be sure, took care not to show himself at the meeting. But when it was found out that Iduna had last been seen walking with him, Bragi went after him and brought him in before all the Asia. Then Father Odin, who sat on his high throne, looking very tired and sad, said, O oh Loki, what is this that you have done? You have broken your promise of brotherhood and brought sorrow upon Asgard. Fail not to bring home again our sister, or else come not yourself within our gates. Loki knew well that this command must be obeyed, and besides, even he was beginning to wish for Iduna again. So, borrowing the cloak of falcon feathers which belonged to the goddess Freya, he put it on and set out for Yugard and the castle of the giant Tiasi, which was a gloomy cave in a high rock by the sea. And there, he found poor Iduna shut up in prison. By good luck, the giant was away fishing when Loki arrived, so he was able to fly in without being seen through the narrow opening in Iduna's rock cell. You would have taken him to be just a falcon bird, but Iduna knew it was really Loki and was filled with joy to see him. Without stopping to talk, Loki quickly changed her into a nut, which he held fast in his falcon claws, and flew swiftly northward over the sea toward Asgard. He had not gone far 
when he heard a rushing noise behind them, and he knew it must be the eagle. Faster and faster flew the falcon with his precious nut, but the fierce eagle flew still faster after them. Meanwhile, for five days, the dwellers in Asgard gathered together on the city walls, gazing southward to watch for the coming of the birds, while Loki and Iduna, chased by Tiasi the eagle, flew over the wide sea, separating Yugard, the land of the giants, from Asgard. Each night, the eagle was nearer his prey, and the watchers in the city were filled with fear, lest he should overtake their friends. At last, they thought of a plan to help Iduna. Gathering a great pile of wood by the city walls, they set fire to it. When Loki reached the place, he flew safely through the thick smoke and flame. For you know, he was the god of fire. And dropped down into the city with his little nut held fast in his falcon claws. But when the heavy eagle came rushing on after them, he could not rise above the heat of the fire and smothered by the smoke, fell down and was burned to death. There was great joy in Asgard at having the dear Iduna back again. Her friends gathered around her, and she invited them all into her garden, where the withered trees and flowers began to sprout and blossom. The gay birds came back, singing and building their nests and the happy little brooks went dancing under the trees. Iduna sat with Bragi among her friends, and they all feasted upon her golden apples. She was so thankful to be free and at home in her garden again. Once more, the Asher became young and strong, and the two dark strangers went away, for happiness and peace had come back to Asgard. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 of Asgard Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Julie Yu Asgard Stories By Mary H. Foster and Mabel H. Cummings Skadi. While Iduna's friends were still crowding about her, all joyful and glad at getting her home again, they spied someone afar off coming toward Asgard. As the figure drew nearer, they saw it was Skadi, the tall daughter of the frost giant Tiasi, who had chased Iduna. She was dressed all in white fur and carried a shining hunting spear and arrows. Slung over her shoulder were snowshoes and skates, for Skadi had come from her mountain home in the icy north. Very angry about the loss of her father, she had come to ask the Asher why they had been so cruel to him. Father Odin spoke kindly to her, saying, We will do honour to your father by putting his eyes in the sky, where they will always shine as two bright stars, and the people in Midgard will remember Tiasi whenever they look up at night and see the two twinkling lights. Besides this, we will also give you gold and silver. A scardy, thinking money could never repay her for the loss of her father, was still angry. Loki looked at her stern face, and he said to himself, If we can only make Skadi laugh, she will be more ready to agree to the plan. And he began to think of some way to amuse her. Taking a long cord, he tied it to a goat, it was an invisible cord, which no one could see, and Loki himself held the other end of it. Then 
he began to dance and caper about, and the goat had to do just what Loki did. It was really such a funny sight that all the gods shouted with laughter, and even poor, sorrowful Skadi had to smile. When the Asia saw this, they proposed another plan. Skadi might choose one of the gods for her husband, but she must choose from seeing only his bare feet. The giantess looked at them all as they stood before her, and when she saw the bright face of Order, more beautiful than all the rest, she agreed to their plan, saying to herself, "It might be that I should choose him, and then I should surely be happy." The gods then stood in a row behind the curtain, so that Skadi could see nothing but their bare feet. She looked carefully at them all, and at last chose the pair of feet which seemed to her the whitest and of the finest shape, thinking those must be borders. But when the curtain was taken away. She was surprised and sorry to find she had chosen Nier, the god of the seashore. The wedding took place at Asgard, and when the feasting was over, Skadi and Nier went to dwell in his home by the sea. At first, they were very happy, for Nier was kind to his giant bride. But how could you expect one of the Aesir to live happily very long, with a frost giantess for his wife? Skadi did not like the roar of the waves, and hated the cries of the seagulls and the murmur of gentle summer winds. She longed for her frozen home, far away in the north, amid ice and snow. And so. They finally agreed that, for nine months of the year, Nyrd would live with Skadi among her snowy mountains, where she found happiness in hunting over the white hills and valleys on her snowshoes, with her hunting dogs at her side, or skating on the icebound rivers and lakes. Then, for the three short months of summer. Skadi must live with Nyrd in his palace by the sea, while he calmed the stormy ocean waves and helped the busy fishermen to have good sailing for their boats. Nyrd loved to wander along the shore, his jacket trimmed with a fringe of lovely seaweeds, and his belt made of the prettiest shells on the beach. With the friendly little sandpipers running before him, and beautiful gulls and other seabirds sailing in the air above his head, sometimes he loved to sit on the rocks by the shore, watching the seals play in the sunshine, or feeding the beautiful swans, his favorite birds. There is a kind of sponge, which the people in the north still call. Nyrd's glove, in memory of this old Norse god. End of chapter ten. Chapter eleven of Asgard Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Julie Yu. Asgard Stories. By Mary H. Foster and Mabel H. Cummings. Border. Border was the best beloved of all the gods. Odin was their father and king. To him they turned for help and wise advice. But it was to Border they went for loving words and bright smiles. The sight of his kind face was a joy to the Aesir, and to all the people of Midgard. They sometimes called him the God of Light, a good name for him because he truly gave to the world light and strength. 
Bodo was the son of Odin and Frigga. He was the most gentle and lovely of all the gods. His beautiful palace in Asgard was bright and spotless. No evil creature could enter there. No one who had wrong thoughts could stay in that palace of love and truth. At last, after the bright summer was over, for many days, Bodder had looked sad and troubled. Some of the Asia saw it, but most of all, his loving, watchful mother, Frigga. Bodder could not bear to worry his mother, so he kept his sorrow to himself, saying nothing about it. But at last, Frigga drew his secret from him, and then his friends knew that Bodder had had dreams which told of coming trouble, dreams of his leaving all his friends and going away from Asgard to dwell in another land. Onan and Frigga, fearing the dreams may come true and they must lose their beloved son, began to think what they could do to prevent it. Then the loving mother said, I will make all things in the world promise not to hurt our son. And so, Queen Frigga sent out for everything in the whole world and everything came trooping to Asgard, to her palace. All living creatures came from the land, from the water, and from the air. All plants and trees came, all rocks, stones, and even the metals under the earth, where the busy dwarfs worked. Fire came, and water, as well as all poisons and sickness. Everything promised not to harm the good border, except one little plant called mistletoe, which was so small that Frigga did not send for it, feeling sure it could not do any harm. Now I am happy once more, said the queen, for our border is safe. And she sat at peace in her beautiful palace, rejoicing that her dear son was free from all danger. But Odin, the wise old father, still felt uneasy, even after all these promises, fearing what might happen. So he took his eight-footed steed, Sneipner, and rode forth from Asgard to the underworld to find Hela, the wise woman who ruled over that far-off land. She could tell everything that was going to happen, and she knew the names of all those who were coming to dwell with her. Odin was the only one wise enough to speak with Hela, but no one else knew the words that would call her forth from her dwelling. But when Odin called, she came to answer. Tell me, said he, for whom are you making ready this costly room? We make ready for Border, the god of light, replied Hela. Who then will slay Border and bring such darkness and sorrow to Asgard? Again, said the wise woman. It is Hodder, Border's twin brother, who will slay the sun god. And with these words she vanished. Sadly, Father Odin returned to Asgard and told his wife the words of Hela. But Frigga was not troubled in her heart, for she felt sure that nothing would hurt her dear son. One beautiful sunny day at the end of summer, the gods had all gone out to an open field beyond Asgard to have some sports. As they all knew that nothing could hurt Border, they placed him at the end of the field for a target, and then took turns throwing the darts at him, just for the fun of seeing them fall off without hurting him. They thought this was showing great honor to Border and he was pleased to join in the sport. Loki happened to be away when they began to play, and when he came, was angry in his heart that nothing could hurt Border. 
Why should he be so favored? I hate him," said Loki to himself, and began at once to plan some evil. All this while, Queen Frigga sat in her palace, thinking of all her dear sons and of how much good they did to men. As she sat, thus thinking and spinning with her hands, there came a knock at the door. The queen called, "Come in!" And an old woman stood before her. Frigga spoke kindly to her, and soon the old woman said she had passed by the field where the gods were playing and throwing sharp weapons at Balder. Oh yes," said Frigga. "Neither metal nor wood can hurt him, for all things in the world have given me their promise." What? said the old woman. Do you mean that all things have really vowed to spare Balder? All, replied the queen, except one little plant that grows on the eastern side of Asgard. It is called mistletoe, and I thought it too small and soft to do any harm. Before long, the old woman went away. And when she was quite out of sight of Frigga's palace, threw off her woman's clothes. And who do you suppose it was? Why, no woman at all, but that wicked Loki, of course, who hurried away out of Asgard to find the poor little plant that did not know about Baldur's danger. When he came to the place where the plant grew. Loki, cutting off a branch, quickly made a sharp arrow, which he carried back to the playground, where the Aesir was still at the game. All but one, Holder, the god of darkness, Balder's blind twin brother. Then, Loki went up to Holder, and said to him in a low voice, "Why do you not join the others in doing honor to Balder?" I cannot see to take aim, you know, and besides, I have no weapon," said Holder. "Come then, here's a fine new dart for you, and I will guide your hand," whispered wicked Loki. Then he slipped the arrow of mistletoe wood into Holder's hand, and aimed it himself at Balder, who stood there so bright and smiling. Then. Poor blind Holder heard a dreadful cry from all the gods. Balder, the beautiful, had fallen, struck by the arrow. He would now be taken away from them, to live with Hela in the underworld. Every heart was filled with sorrow for this dreadful loss, but no one tried to punish him, who had done the wicked deed, for they stood upon sacred ground. And the field was named the Peace Stead, or Place of Peace, where no one might hurt another. Besides, the gods did not know it was the fourth Loki who hated Balder that had struck him down. When Frigga heard the sad news, she asked, "Who would win her love by going to the underworld and begging Hela to let Balder come back to them?" Hermod, the swift messenger god, ready to do his mother's bidding, set forth at once on the long journey. Nine days and nights he travelled without resting, until he came to Hela's underworld. There he found Balder, who was glad to see him, and sent messengers to his friends in Asgard. Hela said. Balder might return to them on one condition: that every living creature and everything in the world must weep for him. So Hermod hastened back to Asgard, and when the Aesir heard Hela's answer, they sent out messengers over the world to bid all things weep for Balder, their bright sun god. Then. Did the beasts, the birds, 
the fishes, the flowers and trees, even stones and metals weep. As indeed we can see the teardrops come to all things when they are changed from heat to cold. As the messengers were coming back to Asgard, they met an old woman, whom they bade weep, but she replied, Let Hela keep border down below. Why should I care? When the Asher heard of this, they thought it must have been the same old woman who went before to Frigga's palace, and we know who that was. And so, bother the beautiful, bother the bright, did not come back, and all the dwellers in Asgard were sad and sorrowful without him. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of Asgard Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Julie Yu Asgard Stories By Mary H. Foster and Mabel H. Cummings Edges Feast Aja was the ruler of the ocean, and his home was deep down below the tossing waves, where the water is calm and still. There was his beautiful palace in the wonderful coral caves, its walls all hung with bright coloured seaweeds, and the floor of white sparkling coral sand. Such wonderful sea plants grew all about, and still more wonderful creatures, some which you could not tell from flowers, waving their pretty fringes in the water, some sitting fastened to the rocks and catching their food with them moving, like the sponges, others darting about and chasing each other. Deep in the wave is a coral grove, where the purple mudlet and goldfish rove, where the sea flower spreads its leaves of blue that never are wet with falling dew. But in bright and changeful beauty shine, far down in the green and glassy brine, the floor is of sand like the mountain drift, and the pearl shells spangle the flinty snow. From coral rocks the sea plants lift, the boughs where the tides and billows flow. The water is calm and still below, for the winds and waves are absent there, and the sands are bright as the stars that glow in the motionless fields of upper air. Percival In that ocean home, lived the lovely mermaids, who sometimes came up above the waves to sit on the rocks and comb their long golden hair in the sunshine. They had heads and bodies like beautiful maidens, with fish tails instead of feet. One day, the gods in Asgard gave a feast, and Edja was invited. He could not often leave home to visit Asgard, for he was always very busy with the ocean winds and tides and storms. But calling his daughters, the waves, he bade them keep the ocean quiet while he was away and look after the ships at sea. Then Edja went over Bifrost, the rainbow bridge to Asgard, where they had such a gay party and such feasting that he was sorry when the time came to go home. But at last, he said goodbye to Father Odin and the rest of the Asher. He thanked them all for the pleasure they had given him, saying, If only I had a kettle that held enough meat for us all to drink, I would invite you to visit me. Thor, who was always glad to hear about eating and drinking, said, I know of a kettle a mile wide and a mile deep. I will fetch it for you. Then Edger was pleased and set a day for them all to come to his great feast. 
So, Thor took with him his brother, the brave Tyr, who knew best how to find the kettle, and together they started off in Thor's thunder chariot, drawn by goats, on the way to Yugard, the home of the giants. When they reached that land of ice and snow, they soon found the house of Hima, the giant who owned Mile Deep, as the big kettle was called. The gods were glad to find that the giant was not at home, and his wife, who was more gentle than most of her people, asked them to come in and rest, advising them to be ready to run when they should hear the giant coming, and to hide behind a row of kettles which hung from a beam at the back end of the hall. For, says she, my husband may be very angry when he finds strangers here. And often, the glance of his eye is so fierce that he kills. At first, the mighty Thor and brave Tyr were not willing to hide like cowards. But at last, they agreed to the plan, upon the good wife promising to call them out as soon as she had told her husband about them. It was not long before they heard the heavy steps of Himmer as he came striding into his icy home. And very lucky it was for Thor and Tyr that the giantess had told them to hide, for when the giant heard that two of the Asia from Asgard were in his home, so fierce a flash shot from his eyes that it broke the beam from which the kettles hung, and they all fell broken on the floor except mile deep. After a while, the giant grew quiet, and at last, even began to be polite to his guests. He had been unlucky at his fishing that day, so he had to kill three of his oxen for supper. Thor, being hungry, as usual, made Humor quite angry by eating two whole oxen, so that when they rose from the table, the giant said, if you keep on eating as much at every meal as you have tonight, Thor, you will have to find your own food. Very well, said Thor. I will go fishing with you in the morning. Next morning, Thor set forth with the giant. And as they walked over the fields toward the sea, Thor cut off the head of one of the finest oxen for bait. Of course, you may know that Huma was not pleased at this, but Thor said he should need the very best kind of bait, for he was hoping to catch the Migat serpent, that dangerous monster who lived at the bottom of the ocean, coiled around the world with his tail in his mouth. When they came to the shore where the boat was ready, each one took an oar, and they rowed out to deep water. Hima was tired first and called to Thor to stop. We are far enough out, he cried. This is my usual fishing place where I find the best whales. If we go farther, the sea will be rougher and we may run into the Migat serpent. As this was just what Thor wanted, he rowed all the harder and did not stop until they were far out on the ocean. Then he baited his hook with the ox's head and threw it overboard. Soon, there came a fierce jerk on the line. It grew heavier and heavier, but Thor pulled with all his might. He tucked so hard that he broke through the bottom of the boat and had to stand on the slippery rocks beneath. All this time, the giant was looking on, wondering what was the matter. But when he saw the horrid head of the Mikat serpent rising above the waves, he was so frightened that he cut the line. And Thor, 
after trying so hard to rid the world of that dangerous monster, saw him fall back again under the water, even meaner the magic hammer, which Thor hurled at the creature, was too late to hit him. And so the two fishermen had to turn back and wade to the shore, carrying the broken boat and oars with them. The giant was proud to think he had been too quick for Thor, and after they reached the house, he said to the thunder god, Since you think you're so strong, let us see you break this goblet. If you succeed, I will give you the big kettle. This was just what Thor wanted, so he tightened his belt of strength and threw the goblet with all his might against the wall. But instead of breaking the goblet, he broke the wall. A second time he tried, but did no better. Then the giant's wife whispered to Thor, throw it at his head. And she sang in a low voice as she turned her spinning wheel. Hard the pillar, hard the stone, Hard the yet the giant's bone. Stones shall break and pillars fall. Humors for it breaks them all. Yet again, Thor threw the goblet, this time against the giant's head, and it fell, broken in pieces. Then Tyr tried to lift the mild deep kettle for he was in a hurry to leave this land of ice and snow. But he could not stir it from its place, and Thor had to help him before they could get it out of the giant's house. When Himmer saw the gods, whom he hated, carrying off his kettle, he called all his giant friends, and they started out in chase of the Asher. But when Thor heard them coming, he turned and saw their fierce, grinning faces glaring down at him from every rocky peak and iceberg. Then the mighty thunderer raised Myrna, the hammer, above his head and hurled it among the giants, who became stiff and cold, all turned into giant rocks that still stand by the shore. Aja was very glad to get mild deep, so he set to work to make the meat in it, to get ready for the great feast. At the time of the flax harvest, when all the Aja were coming from Asgard to visit him. Before the day came, all light and joy had gone from the sacred city, because the bright bother had been slain and the homes of the gods were dark and lonely without him. So they were all glad to visit Aja to find cheer for the sadness. There was Father Odin with his golden helmet and Queen Frigga wearing her crown of stars. Golden-haired Sif, Friar with prison garment, the wonderful necklace, and all the noble company of the Asher, all except mighty Thor, who had gone far away to the giant land. As they all sat in Aegir's beautiful ocean hall, drinking the sweet mead and talking together, Loki came in and stood before them. But finding he was not welcome and no seat saved for him, he began saying ugly things to make them all angry. And at last, he grew angry himself and slew Edge's servant because they praised him. The Asher drove him out from the hall. But once more, he came in and said such dreadful things that at last Frigga said, Oh, if my son Bother were only here, he would silence thy wicked tongue. Then Loki turned to Frigga and told her that he himself 
was the very one who had slain Border. He had no sooner spoken than a heavy peal of thunder shook the hall. An angry Thor strode in, waving his magic hammer. Seeing this, the coward Loki turned and fled, and Asgard was rid of him forever. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 of Asgard Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Rabbi Julie Yu. Asgard Stories by Mary H. Foster and Mabel H. Cummings The Punishment of Loki When Loki was driven out by the mighty Thor from Edger's palace hall, he knew that he could never again be allowed to come among the gods in Asgard. Many times had this mischievous fire god brought trouble and sorrow to the Asia, but now he had done the most cruel deed of all. He had slain Border the Good and had driven all light and joy from Asgard. Far away he fled among the mountains, hoping that no one would find him there and near a lovely mountain stream he built for himself a hut with four doors looking north, east, south and west so that if the wise old father on his high air throne in Asgard should see him and send messengers to punish him the watchful Loki could see them coming and escape by the opposite door he spent most of the days and nights thinking how he could get away from the Asia. If I ran to the stream and turned myself into a fish, he thought, I wonder if they could catch me. I could keep out of the way of a hook, but then there are nets. Edge's wife has a wonderful thing like a net for catching fish and that would be far worse than a hook. When Loki thought of the net, he began to wonder how it was made, and the more he thought, the more he wished he could make one, so as to see how a fish could keep from getting caught in it. He sat down by the fire in his little hut, took a piece of cord and began to make a fish net. He had nearly finished it when, looking up through the open door, he saw three of the Asha in the distance coming toward his hut. Loki well knew that they were coming to catch him, and quickly throwing his net into the fire, he ran to the stream, changed himself into a beautiful spotted salmon, and leaped into the water. A moment later, the three gods entered the hut, and one of them spied the fish net burning in the fire. See, cried he, Loki must have been making this net to catch fish. He always was a good fisherman, and now this is just what we want for catching him. So they snatched the last bit of the net from the fire and by looking at it, found out how to make another, which they took with them to the bank of the stream. The first time the net was put into the water, Loki hit between two rocks, and the net was so light that it floated past him. But the next time, he had a heavy stone weight, which made it sink down, till Loki saw he could not get away unless... He could leap over the net. He did this, but Thor, seeing him, waded out into the stream, where he threw the net again, so that Loki must jump a second time, or else go on out into the deep sea. As he leaped, Thor stooped and caught him in his hand, but the fish was so slippery that Thor could hardly hold it. 
In the struggle, the salmon's tail was pinched so tightly by the thunder god's strong fingers that it was drawn out to a point. And the old stories say that is why salmon tails are so pointed ever since. Thus was Loki caught in his own trap, and dreadful was his punishment. The Asia chained him to a high rock and placed a great poisonous serpent hanging over the cliff above his head. If it had not been for Loki's good, faithful wife, he would have died of the poison that dropped from the snake's mouth. She watched by her husband, holding a cup above him to catch the poison. Only when she had to turn aside to empty the cup did the drops fall upon Loki. Then they gave him such terrible pain that he shook the earth with his struggles. And the people in Mika fled from the dreadful earthquake. In Iceland, the great geysers, spring of hot water, burst through the earth. And in the southlands, burning ashes and lava poured down the mountain sides. There, chained to the cliff, the cruel mischievous Loki was to lie until the twilight of the gods, the dark day of Ragnarok, where all the mighty evil monsters and beasts would get free, and the terrible battle be fought between them and the gods of Asgard. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of Asgard Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Julie Yu Asgard Stories by Mary H. Foster and Mabel H. Cummings Chapter 14 The Twilight of the Gods Loki and Fenrir, the wolf, were safely bound, each to his separate cliff. But still, happiness and peace did not return to Asgard, for Balder was no longer there, and light and joy had gone from the home of the gods. The Aesir felt that the twilight of the gods, which Odin knew was to come, must be near. Soon began a long, cold winter. Surely, it must be the beginning of the Fimble winter, which was to come before the last great battle. From the north came cold blasts of freezing wind. Snow and ice covered the earth. Men could not see the face of the sun or the moon. Everywhere there was darkness. The people grew fierce and unhappy and wicked, for they seemed no longer to love each other. So the evil deeds of men kept on, and the fierce frost giants grew stronger and stronger. They killed the trees and flowers and bound the lakes and rivers with icy bands. Even when summertime came, the cold still held on and no one could see the green grass or the beautiful golden sunlight. The frost giants were pleased to see the trouble they had brought upon men, and hoped they soon could destroy Asgard and the gods. Three long winters passed, with no light to warm and brighten the world. After that, still three other dreary winters, and then, the eagle who sat on top of the great world tree, Idrasil, gave a loud, shrill cry. At that, the earth shook, the rocks crumbled and fell, so that Loki and the wolf were freed from the chains. The waters of the deep ocean rose and rolled high over the land, and up above the waves, writhing out of the deep, came the monster, Midgard Serpent, to join in the last battle. Now, the enemies of the gods were gathering from all sides, the frost giants, 
the mountain giants with Loki, Fenrir, and the Midgard serpent. Heimdall, the faithful watchman, looked from his watchtower by the rainbow bridge, and when he saw the host of monsters appearing and raging towards Asgard, he blew his magic horn, Jaila, which was the signal of warning to the gods. When Father Odin heard the blast of Heimdall's horn, he hastened to arm himself for the battle. Once again, it is said that the All Father sought wisdom at Mimir's fountain, asking to know how best to lead the Asia against their enemies. But what Mimir said to him, no one ever knew. For a second call sounded from the Jaila horn, and the gods, with Odin at the head, rode forth from Asgard to meet their foes. Thor took his place beside Odin, but they were soon parted in the struggle. The thunder god fell upon his old enemy, the serpent, whom twice before he had tried to slay, and after a fierce fight, he at last conquered and slew the monster. But the poisonous breath from the serpent's mouth overcame the mighty Thor, and he also fell. Heimdall and Loki came face to face, and each slew the other. Thus, every one of the gods battled with his foe, till at last the darkness grew deeper, and all, both gods and giants, lay dead. Then fire burst forth, raging from Yuga to Asgard, and all the worlds were destroyed in that dreadful day of Ragnarok. But this was not the end of all. After many months and years and even centuries had passed, a new world began to appear. With the fair ocean and the beautiful land, with a bright shining sun by day and the moon and stars by night. Then, once more, the light and heat from the sun made the grass and trees grow and the flowers bloom. Border and Horder came to this beautiful new world and walked and talked together. Thor's sons were there too, and with them, the Hammer, Mirna, no longer for use against giants, but for helping men build homes. Two people, a man and a woman, who were kept safe through the raging fire, now came to dwell on the earth, and all their children and grandchildren lived at peace with each other in this beautiful new world. Boda and Hoda talked often of the old days when the Asia dwelt in Asgard, before Loki, the wicked one, brought darkness and trouble to them. With loving words, they spoke of Odin and Frigga, the brave Tyr, who gave his right hand to save the Asher, of mighty Thor and faithful Heimdall, of lovely fire and her beautiful necklace, and of fair Iduna's garden, where they used to sit and eat her magic apples. But still, they said, we know now that this new world is fairer than the old, and here, also, the loving All Father watches over his children. End of chapter 14 End of Asgard Stories by Mary H. Foster and Mabel H. Cummings